Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to the talk. Uh, how many people here are from out of town and is just blown away by this weather? 518 is when the sunset, you're going to have a treat. And by the way, uh, my name is Cassio Goldschmidt. I'm the principal information security leader for NCR, the National Cash Register. And uh, we are high. If you like the sunset, if you like Southern California, come talk to me, come to talk to Jason or Kevin. Uh, Jason and Kevin are right there the, in gray shirt, blue shirt. Uh, we are, have openings for uh, pen testers and uh, vulnerability management. But that's not what I want to talk today. I want to talk about Bitcoin and uh, specifically about the security of Bitcoin. This is one of the most ambitious talks that I will probably ever do because I'm going to try to explain to you how Bitcoin works. That's the first thing. The other thing is the media did an inc incredible disservice to Bitcoin, and I want to get the facts straight. And by the way, I really want to talk about security. So there's a lot that I want to cover in this talk. And to make things worse, I get incredibly excited about Bitcoin. Why? Because it's game changer. It's really a changing paradigm. It's a change in the way people are doing things. Let's first start with uh, Bitcoin and uh, with capital B and the Bitcoin with the lowercase b. The uppercase b is the money, it's the currency, okay? While the lowercase b is actually the technology. And that's the focus of the stock. The technology that underlie, uh, underlies Bitcoin can be used for so many different things. And people just are scratching the surface of what things such as the blockchain can you know, do and uh, where they can be used. For example, Bitcoin, uh, the system, could be used to do voting. I don't mean like national voting for president, but voting for routers, for example, to try to find the best route you know, on a network. Uh, it could be used as a proof of state. Right, so uh, real estate, domain name services, a lot of things like that you could use to track miles uh, in a very different way that is done today. Uh, Bitcoin is a decentralized system, which really means there are no central authorities that actually control Bitcoin. Anyone can join, it's censorship uh, resisted. So what I want to say is that if you want to create a Bitcoin address and start buying Bitcoins, and trading bitcoins, you can do, you don't need anybody's permission to do that. If you want to start mining bitcoins, all you have to do is start you know, your mining business and uh, it, it's, you don't need permission from anybody in order to do that. In fact, Bitcoin, as, as you know, was used by uh, Silk Road to you know, uh, do drug dealings and so on. And those are like, you know, possibly one of the worst, you know, the worst type of people out there and still the system was so resilient that actually tried to, you know, was able to withstand all sorts of fraud. Um, the system has all the transactions and uh, they are put in a public ledger called the blockchain and that all, all this information about the transactions, who, by what, and when, and so on, is all public. So this is a quite a departure from, uh, for example, your financial service system, right? Everything goes to the internet Anybody can download the entire history of all transactions in Bitcoin. Another very important part is that the records there are in this blockchain are immutable. Once they are there, Alice paid Bob 10 Bitcoins, it stays there forever, which is something that uh, very few systems, if any, have in computer science. A transaction that once it's there, it's there. It's not something that can be reversed, like a credit card transaction. Uh, Bitcoin is a standardized way of talk money. In other words, it's open source. Everyone uses pretty much the same implementation. So that leads to a lot of really great things. So for example, you could do or have the notion of programmable money. So for example, once they receive certain funds, that fund is going to be spent only if it satisfies a certain script. And that's something that we don't have today and you can have with Bitcoin. Now, I told about a lot of uh, the characteristics about Bitcoin and uh, why I think it's uh, revolutionary, the fact that you know, everything is public and it's permissionless and so on. 
I want you to take a second and think about the security about the system. We security people really like to have things that are centralized. We like authorization. We like authentication. We like white listing. Sometimes we use black listing. We like encryption. I just told you, hey, it's permissionless. And Schmo can actually start working here. And it's going to produce records, blocks, to the blockchain. We don't know what the next record is going to be. But if somebody actually puts a record that is invalid, we actually can know that that record is invalid and refuse that record. And that's the nice thing about Bitcoin. Basically, all those controls that you have in security, they're no longer there. However, there is security in the system, and that's what we're going to talk about. So I will start with a very uh, high-level example of uh, the currency and how it works. Bob will pay 10 Bitcoins to Alice. So here's Bob, and then you have Alice in the other side, and both of them have what we call Bitcoin wallets. Bitcoin wallets are nothing more than just a application, a computer application, and here I assume that uh, Bob has more than 10 Bitcoins, and uh, Alice has a uh, wallet and is receiving uh, some Bitcoins. In order to receive, she needs to have an address. The address looks like that string, is long string that you're seeing starts you know, sometimes with a one, with a three, uh, and then you have uh, the same string represented as a 2D barcode, so that it makes easier for people using cell phones to scan and know the address without typing up this long uh, string. So Alice tells Bob, hey, here's my address. Now pay me 10 bitcoins. Next thing uh, Bob does, he goes to his um, wallet, types up Alice's address and 10 bitcoins, click Enter, and this transaction goes to what I'm calling right now a Bitcoin cloud. And uh, eventually, Alice is going to see a message on her wallet application saying, hey, you just, you just became 10 Bitcoin richer. Right? And that's pretty much how it works. Now, there's a lot of misconception that the media created. And because I believe that all of you got uh, to know about Bitcoin, reading you know, a bunch of things that are written in the media, I want to talk about that. So first thing, users, Bob and Alice, are not drug dealers, okay? Uh, there was a lot of talk about Silk Road, and uh, Bitcoin actually strived in that environment for one reason. It was because it was the only currency that was actually accepted there, right? There's, it's not centralized, so anybody could buy, anybody could trade, and while the credit cards would you know, just go away and not allow transactions on Silk Road, that didn't happen with Bitcoin. These days, you have um, big companies such as Amazon, CVS, Target, Expedia, Zappos. They all accept Bitcoin. And none of those are actually drug dealers, uh, with exceptions of uh, CVS, that they actually are drug dealers, right? Bob and Alice are not uh, anonymous. A lot of people think, hey, I'm going to buy this uh, you know, obscure type of currency and I'm going to do anonymous transactions. Be very careful with that notion. Bitcoin, uh, as I mentioned, has all the transactions published in a public ledger that anybody can copy and it's called the blockchain. Okay, so uh, it's not anonymous. At best, it's pseudo-anonymous, okay? A paid B. You don't know who A is, you don't know who B is, but you can start inferring things by, you know, where the good was delivered, for example, the address. And because all the transactions are there, you can actually unravel, you know, transaction after transaction and so on. In fact, um, financial institutions such as Wells Fargo, Chase, they're incredibly interested in Bitcoin exactly because they can have you know, uh, fingertip control of all the transactions one by one. And there's a bank requirement called know your customer and you know, uh, reasons to look from, uh, for that from a fraud perspective. The other misconception is that uh, Alice and Bob are human. Actually, Bitcoin can be used in order to pay a script when you pay a script, the only way to actually use those coins or use that fund is to make that script, uh, script result in a true statement. In other words, fulfill the condition of that script. And that's a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about that. 
Next, I want to talk about coins. Um, you guys are pretty smart. You know there are no uh, golden coins. It's just something that the media wanted to have a picture so they can symbolize Bitcoin. But a lot of people think about Bitcoin as something that we're going to be produced up to 21 million coins out there. And uh, that's pretty much it. And those coins are indivisible or just divisible by you know, two uh, digits, um, which is not the case. Bitcoins, although it, uh, 21 million are going to be uh, produced, they can di be divided up to 4.2 quadrillion parts. And those parts are called Satoshi. Nakamoto, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is the synonymous of the guy who invented Bitcoin. We don't know if it is a guy, we don't know if it is a girl, we don't know if it is a company. Somebody one day put this paper on the cypherpunk mailing list and people start discussing the merits and whether this is going to work or not. And then someday, some, I mean, at some point somebody said, hey, wait, who is this Nakamoto guy? And then people start Googling and go, well, I guess it's nobody. There's nobody with this name, right? So the small unit of Bitcoin is called uh, one Satoshi. Now, you have wallets. And wallets, as I explained in the previous slides, is actually a really good abstraction, right? And you think, hey, in a wallet you have money. Well, that's wrong. That's not what you have in a wallet. Inside a Bitcoin wallet, you have keys. It's a keychain. You have public keys, you have private keys, uh, and you have uh, you know, unspent transactions uh, that you, know, you receive money from. And that's pretty much what you have in the wallet. I'm going to talk about wallets in more detail. Uh, what I want you to know is that it's a keychain. It has just the keys. And by the way, there's no coins in Bitcoin. All that it, there is is actually transactions. A made a transaction of 10 Bitcoins to B. B made a transaction of five Bitcoins to C, and so on. So that uh, idea of balance doesn't exist on Bitcoin. And that's very powerful. Think, for example, about all the airline mileage, you know, uh, mile programs that are out there. Uh, a lot of people think about those programs, and uh, you know, we've seen some type of hacks happen in the past. People who were able to suddenly, uh, uh, you know, take advantage of a SQL injection and get a million miles. You cannot do that with Bitcoin. You cannot just change your balance to a million Bitcoins. Why? Because it's based on transactions. Uh, so that the, the uh, funds that you have need to be based on previous transactions, people paying to you. And uh, that makes uh, the system a lot harder to game than other systems where you have this concept of balance, which is just a number and it's not based on previous transactions. So very well designed system in this sense. So we, go we went through all those mi the misconceptions let me take a minute and talk about how uh, addresses are created for Bitcoin. So you can create an address at leisure of your home using a computer, okay? The step number one is to create a randomly generated 256-bit number. The way you do, you get your favorite cat, you put it in front of your keyboard, and let just the cat wiggle your mouse and type it up in, uh, over your keyboard, or use a good random number generator type of um, uh, application, okay? And that is going to be your private key. So anybody can create their private key. One of the questions that you receive is, what are the odds of two people actually creating the same private key? And the odds are really, really low. I mean, a 256-bit number is a huge address space. In fact, you're going to have more addresses than the entire number of visible atoms in the entire universe. So it's in incredibly, insanely huge, right? So the chances are uh, pretty much known. Should that happen and somebody create exactly the same um, private key and public key that you have, then that person would own all the coins that you have. So yeah, there is a, a risk there, but from a probability perspective, that risk is pretty much known. The next step is to create the public key. And you create using the ECDSA uh, you know, curve. So the curve uses the SAP, uh, SACP256K1. That's the curve that is used for the ECDSA. 
And uh, that's how you create the public key. You can use OpenSSL, any type of application that you like, in order to create that public key. And a lot of people think, OK, so that's the end. That's the Bitcoin address, right? No, wrong. So let me first acknowledge the really nice thing about creating a private and public key. This is far better than your credit card uh, today. Credit card is a, a symmetric secret. It's pretty much like your social security, your password. It's something that you have to keep close to your chest. However, you have to share with other people, and other people will store in their servers, right? What's your social security? And you go, oh, I shouldn't tell anybody, but I'm going to tell uh, to you. And I trust you're going to actually take good care of it, right? And that's why we had all this uh, breaches that we have today. With Bitcoin, you're, uh, you're talking about public and private key. And by the way, you are encouraged to use different address all the time. You know, so uh, the security is really good at this point already. But they made it better. And I really like the third step. Basically, from the public key, you're going to run a hash, SHA-256, uh, which all of you should be familiar with. One of the properties of a hash is that once you hash something, there is no way back. So just by using a SHA-256, there is no way that you can get the public key back from uh, you know, that, that SHA. To make things more secure, uh, Satoshi decided to use the RIPEMD160, uh, which is another type of uh, hashing algorithm to do a second hashing. So should one day SHA-256, for example, get compromised, which would be a really a disaster for everybody, right? the public key is not going to be reviewed. Really, really nice. Right? So you have two algorithms there. Then you have base 58. Everyone knows base 64 as encoding. And people scratch their head, base 58? Really? What is that? Basically, it's base 64, but it excludes things like uh, O and 0, 1 and L. Why? Because those are the characters that usually people uh, mess up what, when typing. Right? So this is very type friendly, uh, although it's a huge you know, uh, string. Plus, there's a prefix, so you know what kind of address is. In the case of a, a person's address, it's going to be one. And then there's a checksum. So if you go and uh, mistype, uh, for example, a eight with a nine, and uh, you know, then switch uh, numbers or letters, uh, once you type in the wallet, it will say, hey, that address is uh, actually wrong because the checksum doesn't work. You're not going to pay, or won't allow you to pay to this address. So here's finally how the address work, and you can verify everything that I just told you. So this is the pay to script, uh, I mean pay to uh, public key type of address. There are several other addresses uh, on Bitcoin. In the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about another one which I consider very interesting, and that's the pay to script hash. Basically, this is the one that I was talking about that is uh, related to uh, having a script and you pay to that script, and you can only spend the funds if the conditions for that script is fulfilled. So you can use for different applications. For example, uh, one of two signatures type of application. So if you have a significant order, and you have, uh, you're receiving Bitcoin funds, basically you could have uh, one of two signatures. So you know, maybe your significant order can go and use uh, their public key in order to spend the funds, or you can use, doesn't matter. If you have a business partner, or uh, two more business partners, you might end up with a two out of three signatures. So the funds can be spent as long as two business partners agree and provide their public, uh, you know, their Bitcoin address, their public key, in order to uh, spend those funds. So let's take a look at um, this uh, scripting language. So here comes a big disappointment for uh, most people. It's a language that is. Um, that is based on a fourth-like reverse Polish notation. So unless you are more than 60 years old, you probably didn't see this kind of thing in your life before, right? It's all uh, gibberish. Uh, what it's pretty much saying is, hey, this is a multi-signature operation uh, with two operands, right? So you have public key A and public key B, and one of them must be used to satisfy. It. Uh, this language does not have any uh, logic bombs. It doesn't have any loops. It's really, really um, uh, limited. And the reason it's in a reverse Polish notation um, 
way is because you don't even have parsing. So a lot of people look at that and said, well, I was expecting more from a scripting language. Um, don't, uh, don't give up. There's a system called uh, Ethereum. And Ethereum is pretty much uh, Bitcoin abstracted to just the, the core parts of Bitcoin. And there you can find a full uh, scripting language that you can use with the blockchain and everything else that is, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin was made of. So if you really want to look at something that you can actually program and get all the blockchain uh, properties, look at Ethereum, very interesting system. So back to this uh, creation of this address, which is the script. You get the script, and then you do the same hashing that you did before. SHA-256, RIPEMD-160, and then you make it an address using the base64. You put a 5 in front, which is going to become a 3 once it's base58. Uh, base no, um, no checksum is necessary, and that's how the address is created. The interesting part is that once this address is created, the overall way to use it is pretty much the same. Back to the Bob and Alice uh, example. Uh, if Alice uh, wanted Bob to pay for a script, she would just say, hey, here's my address, and Bob would pay the very same way, okay? And there would be no difference. Bob can be as clueless about computing and computers as he wants. All he needs to know is how to pay, and that's exactly the same use case. Now, for Alice, that's a different story. If before, if you want to uh, use the funds, you would need to sign and show your public key. Here, if you want to use the fund once you have the script, you have to show the original script. So it's really important to keep that script. And then a signature for public key A or public key B. One of the two need to be presented. right? So it's really important to actually keep uh, your, um, your um, your public and private keys, as well as your scripts. The way you keep that is in your keychain. And your keychain, again, is the wallet. So let's go back to wallets and talk about those wallets and the different types of wallets that are out there. First one is the client-side wallet. Okay, This is a wallet that runs in your PC. It's a computer program you download to your PC, and then that's, you know, that's what you use. Um, there's also uh, Bitcoin applications that you can download for your smartphone. The difference between the ones that you download to your PC and the ones that you download to your smartphone is the following. Uh, you can download the entire blockchain to your PC, which is about 30, 30 gigs of size. It's really huge. And uh, you won't be able to do that with your smartphone uh, if you want to continue to use your smartphone, probably. right? So whenever a transaction needs to be validated, uh, with the PC um, Bitcoin wallet, you can start validating without going anywhere, without sending any network par uh, packages, and that means without uh, disclosing any information about your transactions. With the wallet that runs in your uh, phone, you're probably going to be asking uh, other nodes on the internet about the transactions and trying to make sure that things are not being double spent. Right, so that's one of the differences between the two types of wallets. One thing that security people should be careful is that the wallet, as I said, is a keychain. So if you uh, have some keys and you back up that wallet and suddenly you lose that backup or somebody gets a hold of your backup and at that time you had, let's say, 10 bitcoins and today you have 1,000 bitcoins, when somebody restores that backup, it will show a thousand bitcoins, right? It's going to show exactly what you have today because the keys are going to be valid still, right? And that's uh, something to, to be, be very careful about. The other type of wallet is the web wallet. The web wallet is nothing more than a website that you go to and then you log in and you, you might be able to buy bitcoins, you might be able to uh, send bitcoins to other people and we'll try to uh, abstract all this mumbo jumbo of Bitcoin and creation of addresses and so on for you. So it ends up looking a lot like an online bank, right? Pretty much if, if you go to one of those sites, you're going to say, hey, it looks like a stripped down uh, banking site, right? And uh, there are a couple things to uh, be worried or to you know, think when you use such system. One is that it goes completely against the initial idea of Bitcoin, which was to have this decentralization. 
Now everything is centralized. And when you have everything centralized, you have a big target for breaches, which can be a big problem. The other thing is that somebody's creating those address for you. And those addresses in Bitcoin is whatever gets you closer to being anonymous. If somebody is actually creating the address for you, they know exactly all the transactions that are happening. So that's why Chase and Wells Fargo and so on are so interested in Bitcoin and, uh, or blockchain technology. It's just because it's an excellent way to uh, track exactly all the transactions that are happening in a database that uh, in, in a lot of uh, instances is better than your, your SQL database to you know, track this kind of stuff. So uh, that's, you know, that's one of the, the issues with the website or you know, using a, a web application. The other one, the, uh, there's another flavor of uh, web wallets, and pretty much is the one that all the uh, scripting is coming to your browser as JavaScript, and then the keys and everything else is in, are encrypted and go back to the website. So the website is just, uh, is just destroying some, um, some blobs, and not really real data. And all the transactions happen in your browser with JavaScript, which is kind of a very interesting way uh, for the website to say, hey, I have no value here, right? So uh, that's why I mentioned. There are other type of wallets. There are like brain wallets. There are paper wallets. In other words, write your keys in a piece of paper. Uh, and there are like, uh, you know, uh, other type of wallets that I'm not going to talk here in the interest of time. Uh, but, you know, those two are the, the main ones you're going to find. Now, one thing that is interesting about the wallets is, okay, so it's a keychain. So key management is a big topic on Bitcoin and something that you can look and abstract and learn and try to use uh, in other places as a security professional. So let's talk about that. First one, uh, first type of uh, wallet implementation is the non-deterministic random wallet, which is just a bunch of keys. Every time there is a uh, transaction, a new key is created, a new address is created, and that means you have to back up because if you lose those addresses, you lose your coins, right? Your coins are going to be there in the blockchain, right, in the cloud. However, there's no way to actually access them because you don't have the keys in order to spend the funds anymore. So you have to keep backing up, which is incredibly inconvenient. So no wallet tried to be like that. The next one is the deterministic seeded wallet. So you have a seed, right, that red dot, and from that seed, you have an index and a chain code to create, using hashing, the next key and the next key and so on. So the nice thing is that all you have to back up is actually the seed, right? And because there is a chain code, which is kind of, uh, you should read as entropy, you can create the other uh, addresses and it will look random to the other people outside unless they know the seed, they know the, the initial you know, chain code that was used. So it's a better uh, type of uh, wallet, uh, easier to back up, right, and uh, create all the addresses that you need. The third type, which I consider very smart, is based on the BIP44. BIP is uh, RFC in Bitcoin terms. It's the Bitcoin imp uh, Improvement Proposal. And uh, this is the hierarchical deterministic wallet. So if that one is just a list, the ter deterministic seeded wallet, this one is a tree, right? And if you look at the tree, it uh, really hints to entitlement, right? So for example, you might have a corporation. And in this corporation, you have a CEO. You might have different business units with different departments, right? And those departments can do different things, for example. Departments might have subunits. Uh, departments might be able to spend funds. Departments might be able to receive funds. And that's what you can do with this kind of, um, of uh, schema. Basically, you're going to create uh, a, a public key, a private key, and the chain code. Depending on what you give to your children, they're going to be able to spend, receive, or create children. So for example, if you give the public key, the public key becomes a Bitcoin address, and that means they can receive funds. If you give the private key, that means they can spend funds. And if you give the chain code, they can actually create more children. And at the same time, if you want to see the entire balance for your business, all that you need is actually the, the seed, and then you traverse the tree, and you get the entire balance. 
that you have at any given time. So very smart way of doing uh, key management entitlement, which, for example, for a business banking application, an application that you would have for your business, and you know you would uh, you you would rely on things such as RBAC and ACLs and, and things like that in order to do the same thing. Here's done with math. Uh, if anybody wants to know in more detail how this is done, I'm happy to talk at some point. Unfortunately, I had to take out the slides because of uh, in the interest of, uh, of time. So we talk about the addresses, the wallets, how the wallets are implemented. I want to go back to my initial picture and talk about transactions. So I mentioned, hey, Bob is sending uh, 10 uh, bitcoins to Alice. When he press enter, a network package goes out right to this cloud. What is in that package? So here's an overview of what's in that package. First, as I mentioned, there's no balance. There are no coins. So the only way to actually spend money on Bitcoin or spend coins on Bitcoin is to use unspent transactions. So let's say Bob receive uh, a transaction with uh, five Bitcoins and another one with 15 Bitcoins. And now he has to pay 10 Bitcoins to Alice. How is that going to work? Well, he's going to get the 15 Bitcoin transaction input there, and he could put several others if you know needed. And then he's going to pay Alice. In other words, put Alice address you know, as the person who is going to receive. So we have five Bitcoins which are left. If they are left alone, they're going to be changed for the miners, the guys who are going to actually validate those transactions. You don't want that to happen. So what you do is you, you pay back to yourself, and that's how you get your coins back, uh, and that's how the transaction works. Uh, there's a timestamp. I think it's uh, pretty self-explanatory here. And there are a couple of uh, attacks that could happen. As I mentioned, Bitcoin, as it was created, you have uh, all transactions going in clear text. So you can have uh, some information disclosure of how you're spending your coins, by uh, you know, doing a transaction. These days, uh, Bitcoin is uh, Tor friendly, so that's one way that this can go away. The other um, type of attack is a Siebel uh, attack, which is when you go to an untrusted network, you have to access you know, uh, miners that are in the network. So if uh, you go to an untrusted network, somebody could say, hey, here are all the miners, and they all you know, fake miners, and suddenly you think you're doing transactions, and you're not doing any transaction because those are all fake people, right, or, or fake servers. So those are a couple of the things that uh, can happen. The other one is uh, the transaction uh, can contain arbitrary data. So this is a problem if you think about uh, SQL injection or cross-site scripting. If that data is ever reflected in a database or if the data is uh, reflected on screen on a web browser, that could be a problem. In fact, a lot of people doing experience with Bitcoin were kind of abusing this uh, field that you can have ar arbitrary data in different ways. Now, as you see, uh, oh, here it's really hard to see there's an arrow here. And at the end, end of the arrow, it's pointing to a cloud. So let's look what's inside that cloud. Here's what's inside the cloud. It's miners. And those miners are working very hard. And each one has a copy of the blockchain. And they are trying to solve the next block in the blockchain. That's what they do. So let's look at the job of a miner. Here's the job of the miner. The miner is the guy who validates new transactions of the uh, uh, and the work of other miners. So once you pay somebody, uh, there are a number of validations that need to happen. First, did you have the funds? Are the funds yours? Are those keys correct? Right? Uh, are you paying back more than you actually paid to, to the person? So those are a couple of the validations that the miners are going to do. The other one is uh, once they validate, they validate several transactions, and they record that transaction or the work into a block. The last transaction there is there is called a Coinbase transaction. And the miner just comes and say, well, just because I did this block, I'm going to reward myself out of thin air 25 Bitcoins. And that's how it works. That's how Bitcoins are created. And at this point, everyone's shocked. Like, hey, Cassie, you just said that they just create out of thin air uh, 25 Bitcoins and they reward to themselves. 
why not everyone is doing that? We're going to look at that in a couple slides. But uh, that's how it works. Uh, so they get some reward fees, plus this uh, big, uh, big uh, reward of 25 bitcoins. And by the way, each bitcoin today is uh, worth approximately uh, $400. So we, it's a good chunk of money, right? And the way to keep people honest is using something that is the proof of work. Wait, we're going to talk about that. Uh, one of the very important things here in a potential theoretical attack is called the 50% attack. So uh, miners are creating these uh, blocks, and those blocks need to be validated by the other miners. And once they are validated, they become part of the blockchain, and uh, they're, you know, they become the next block in the blockchain. If somebody or uh, a group of people own more than 50% of all the mining power out there, they can actually dismiss some blocks they don't like, which means some transactions would be just um, uh, dismissed, which is a really bad thing, right? So why I say this is a uh, theoretical attack and not a real attack? Well, basically because if you get to own 30% of the mining power or even 50%, you really want the system to work because otherwise you're going to start losing all the fees or the rewards that you're getting. So you don't want to, you know, suddenly people not trusting you anymore, uh, your work. So, you, you know, the fact that you're making money mining bitcoins prevents people from actually screwing up with the system like that uh, once they uh, achieve a really big uh, chunk of the, you know, bitcoin mining power out there. Uh, there are other types of... Um, of attacks, one is uh, related to uh, time, and also uh, once a uh, miner actually resolves the block, usually it takes 10 minutes to resolve uh, one block in the blockchain. We're going to talk about that later with the proof of work. Uh, but basically, uh, if the miner was able to resolve a block, let's say in uh, three minutes instead of 10, he's not required to send that block to everybody and say, hey, I just solved this. They can actually hold that block and start working the next block. And why they would do that? Well, because probability is on their side, right? So they can uh, think, hey, it's going to take an average 10 minutes, I have a couple more minutes, and try to get the next reward of 25 Bitcoins as well. That would be like, for example, uh, playing tennis. And instead of waiting for your uh, opponent to be in the court to serve, just go and say, hey, you know, boom, serve, point, right? So that's another potential uh, weakness of Bitcoin uh, at the risk of losing that block that you just created because somebody else created. We've been talking about the blockchain. I want to take a minute to talk about the structure of that blockchain and what's there. First thing. The blockchain is composed of blocks. That's pretty obvious, right? So there are several blocks, and they are chained together. The way they are chained together is using the previous block hash. So the next block needs the previous block hash, and so on. So you take one block, the entire integrity of this thing falls like a house of cards. There's a vendor version, I mean, uh, I mean version information, right, in the header. Uh, nothing to talk about that. I mean, pretty you know, uh, self-explanatory. There's the timestamp, same thing here. Uh, there's a Merkle tree hash of all the transactions that went to that block that you see here in the, uh, in the bottom. And basically, uh, what you have here is just optimization. A Merkle tree is a way to optimize a tree so you can actually find whether there were some changes in the tree or what kind of information in that tree using the Merkle tree. So the only thing that I didn't explain here is that nonce. And what is that nonce? And it has to do with the proof of work. Uh, basically, in order to generate a block, you have to uh, win a challenge. And here's the challenge. The challenge is to find a nonce that will make the hash for that entire block have a number of leading zeros. So there's only one way of doing this. Because whenever you do a hash and you change just the tiny little thing of a hash, that number changes wildly. There's no way to know what's the next hash or whether it, where you're getting close, closer or you know, further from finding that, uh, you know, uh, that number. 
the only way to do that is by guessing. And you have to guess a lot. Basically, the Bitcoin system has an algorithm that will uh, make sure that the number of leading zeros in that hash is going to take, up, on average, 10 minutes to be, uh, to be discovered. And every time it will look how you know, mining power got more, uh, more sophisticated and can crunch more uh, hashing, you know, and they will adjust that to always take 10 minutes. This is really interesting, first, because it becomes a lottery, right? People with a lot of mining power might see this and say, hey, it's like going, uh, you know, trying to win the lottery and having more, um, more um, lottery cards and you know, a greater chance of winning, but nothing prevents the guy in you know, Argentina to have having only one card, in other words, a PC running here, getting that nonce right, right away. So it's a really hard problem to solve, right? And at the same time, it's a really easy problem to verify because once that nonce is solved, basically all you have to do is hash and see if the number of leading zeros is you know, smaller than the number that was uh, set, and that's pretty much it. There's another property here. Remember they said that the miner is going to be rewarded uh, 25 bitcoins for every block? Basically, the creation of money is constant in the system. This is something we don't have in any country. Every time that money is printed, people are actually stealing the value of money from your wallet and leaving you with the nominal value of money. In other words, whenever the US government prints money, that $100 bill that I have worth less, right? And I don't know when this is going to happen. With Bitcoin, I know exactly that on average of 10 minutes, 25 Bitcoins are going to be generated right now. That's very powerful, right? And that's how, uh, why it's really hard to cheat the system because should you, know, you create a bunch of uh, uh, blocks, each block is going to take 10 minutes to create. Good luck with that. Right, you cannot just speed up things. Eventually, this led to a bunch of uh, problems. For example, the, the block has a size, and because it takes 10 minutes, you can, in, in all the transactions that you can put in, um, the, there's a transaction uh, ceiling on how many transactions you can have with Bitcoin. And that ceiling was of uh, seven transactions per second, which is laughable if you work for Visa or MasterCard or anybody else. So there has been a lot of uh, discussions on how to increase those, those limits, right? So that's what the proof of work is. And actually, this is used uh, as an anti-DDoS type of solution today. Um, I want to finish the talk, but before I want to talk about the alternative coins. There's one called Namecoin. In the same way, you have this public ledger where, you know, in Bitcoin, you have, uh, you have coins, you could have DNS names. So there would be no conflict, you know who sold, sold the DNS name to who. You could have notary service for proof of existence of land, or you could have systems that completely abstract the Bitcoin uh, you know, invention and is used to actually create different platforms based on the blockchain. So very interesting uh, things. There are a lot more that is being done, right? And that's um, you know, something to, to keep an eye on. So in conclusion, Bitcoin is an invention. And there are multiple uses for Bitcoin, OK? The security model of this thing is completely different from most of the things I've seen in the past. And that fascinates me. And I think there's a lot of use for a lot of applications out there. The technology can be used in an open way, where the, you know, the way it was designed, or it could really be used by banks such as you know, Chase, Wells Fargo, and many, many others. And in fact, they are investing in startups that do this kind of things. And the last, thing, the last point I want to make is that it's an incredibly dynamic system. Right now, you see BIPs, uh, Bitcoin improvement uh, proposals, coming left and right. Some incredible, uh, clever ideas coming up. So keep an eye on, keep an eye on your social network and uh, you know, uh, see what's going to happen with this incredible invention. I thank you so much for your time. Um, do we have time for questions? Questions? Oleg. 
Yeah, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the, the, the topic that you didn't touch. This mm -hmm. is Bitcoin exchanges. And we all know when it goes down, uh -huh. uh, Bitcoin holders will be impacted as well. I've seen some work which was related to solving, you know, a Bitcoin exchange solvency problem. Yes. Uh, so do you know like any good work in this direction or is it, uh, is it just a regulation issue? Yeah, so uh, the way I see uh, is that uh, Bitcoin, the currency, is pretty much the Aussie model of the network. In other words, it's just the most well-known invention of the Bitcoin, the technology, right? And there's still a lot of, uh, you know, issues and, and things related to, you know, solvency and a lot of horror stories. Uh, Silk Road is probably going to become a Hollywood movie, for example, right? Because it's really, really interesting, the story behind that thing. Uh, and at the same time, I look at uh, other inventions that, uh, you know, prevail and some fail in the past, and I compare with Bitcoin. For example, uh, tech stocks. In 97, when I got to the US and started working for Cisco, people would say, hey, all the stocks there is in, um, in, on NASDAQ, they have a problem, they are very volatile, you know, have all these dot-com companies, and they go up and down and so on, right? And you can compare with other things such as Napster, which was a great idea, and, uh, you know, at some point, uh, the main use of Napster, which was for piracy, actually was banned, right? was really bad, and they shut down the thing. So, yes, there will be sol insolvency. There, you know, there's a lot of uh, dirt that will still come out of this Bitcoin. At the same time, there's a lot of compliance that is coming. So you, have, you need to have a bit license in order to have a website uh, dealing with uh, Bitcoins this day, these days. And uh, I think things are going to, you know, hopefully go in the right direction. Uh, if nothing else, this is a really great way of transferring funds from point A to point B. A lot better than, for example, uh, Washington Mutual, which is used to transfer funds outside the U.S. And that's kind of my hope. If nothing else, I think the technology will stay. The technology is strong. Next question. Tin. Casio, do you have any uh, recommendations on thoughts on like an, uh, any wallet that you know has a good balance between security and ease of use? Uh, no, no wallets I would recommend at this time. Uh, if you go to the Bitcoin website, the Bitcoin Core, it's one wallet that can be used. Chapel uh, is another wallet that you can have in your computer. Uh, you have uh, Circle. You have um, uh, Coinbase, which are uh, web wallets. Uh, they're well, well implemented. Um, uh, Coinbase actually came to AppSec US, gave a really great talk on security. So it seems that they have good security behind. But they haven't looked in depth uh, on any wallet. Uh, and I would recommend to have also funds uh, uh, you know, on, on paper wallets. In other words, print your keys and store them as well. Yes. Is the underlying technology for Bitcoin the same as for Litecoin or Parable? Yes. So the question is, is the uh, technology used for Bitcoin the same use for Litecoin? Uh, some of them are, uh, have similar technologies. And uh, we, in the case of Litecoin, instead of uh, taking uh, 10 minutes to solve a block, they actually reduce to, I think, uh, 2.5 minutes. Or, you know, it makes the system have a lot better through, uh, throughput. Right. Some of the alternate coins are actually based on the Bitcoin code. Some others are not. Uh, there is, for example, a uh, prediction system that is out there. Uh, it's called uh, Algor. So basically, you can make predictions of, hey, Hillary is going to win the new, uh, next election. Right. And then if she actually wins the next election, you would get rewarded uh, much like a bet. They don't want to call a bet, but it's a betting system. Right, and that is uh, based on the um, Ethereum, for example. So it, it varies from you know technology to technology. Um, have there been any uh, attempts to try to break into the blockchain and like add a, a next transaction block that would not be valid, or, or any kind of hacks along that line? Yeah, there, there have been a. Uh, um, a, a lot of uh, attempts, and uh, one that I can remember is uh, when we had uh, WikiLeaks, and suddenly all the credit cards, uh, 
uh, were uh, no longer uh, accepting donations to Wikileaks, some people in the Bitcoin community said, hey, let's use Bitcoin, right, for that. And uh, some, some guy, you know, said, yeah, let's, let's go, bring it on. And then Satoshi actually sent an email saying, no, bring it on, don't do that. Because the system at this point is somewhat fragile, right? So uh, he explicitly said, hey, uh, we're not ready for a DDoS attack. Probably by now with all the miners out there and distributed and so on, the system is a lot better. Uh, but um, what I can tell you is that you know, the system was resilient in environments that were pretty hostile. And uh, you know, it, it, uh, it still works, which is a, a great indication. Uh, if more research is coming and uh, flaws are going to be found, remains to be seen. So one of the drawbacks of Bitcoin that I've heard is mm -hmm. just the sheer amount of power that it takes to use it. So there's yes. other coins like Pure Coin that's more of a, a greener coin. Yeah. Do you say things going more that route or just people are just going to have to go to solar or some other <laughs> type of energy to uh, power these mining farms? Yes. So basically the question is, uh, with Bitcoin, uh, the proof of work uh, is based on gas in a hash and that takes a lot of uh, power. And in fact, it does. So people who tried to do that at home suddenly had uh, their elect electricity bill go uh, up to the roof. And these days, you re just cannot do this kind of things. So are there uh, other systems? And the answer is absolutely yes. I think there are other systems out there that are a lot uh, smarter on uh, using power. And that's uh, a, a, a point of concern about you know, if Bitcoin becomes the de facto system, uh, how much power we need. Uh, in order to, to make it work. Uh, the Economist had the article on Bitcoin and they had some very interesting numbers about how much uh, power the miners use. And they were comparing with cities. But cities like the size of Los Angeles was like terrifying. Unfortunately, I don't remember the numbers, but if you want some hard numbers, look for the Economist that talked ab uh, about Bitcoin. Thanks again. If you want to talk about Bitcoin, I'm. Uh, uh, happy to talk anytime. And again, uh, NCR is hiring. If you want to talk to us, also come to talk to me, Kevin or Jason. <laughs>